Well, I want to speak to you this morning a topic called Don't Forget the Bread. And I want to start this morning by sharing a story about a pastor whose wife called him on his way to home and asked him to pick up some bread. And his response was, yeah, sure. His wife responded by asking, do I need to tell you where to find it? His answer was, are you kidding? He says, I was born with a bread aisle tracking system. Uh, just, his wife responded, just stay focused. Uh, she was nervous, and rightly so. Uh, once this pastor's mother had sent him when he was young to buy butter, butter and milk, and he came home with buttermilk. Uh, he went on to share that he's a charter member of the Clueless Husband Shopping Squad. Uh, continuing by saying he could relate to the fellow that came home from the grocery store with one carton of eggs, two sacks of flour, three boxes of cake mix, four sacks of sugar, and five cans of cake frosting. When the guy got home, his wife looked at the sacks of groceries and lamented, I never should have numbered the list. So knowing this pastor, knowing that his wife was counting on him, he parked his car at the market and entered the door. He tells the story like this. En route to the bread aisle, I spotted my favorite cereal, so I picked up a box, which made me wonder if we needed milk. I found a gallon in the dairy section. That cold milk stirred images of one of God's great gifts to humanity, Oreo cookies. The heavenly banquet will consist of tables and tables of Oreo cookies and milk. We'll be spending eternity dipping and slurping our way through. And then he says, okay, enough of that. He continued by saying, I grabbed a back pack of cookies, which happened to occupy the same half of the store as the barbecue potato chips. What a wonderful world this is, he said. Cookies and chips under the same roof. On the way out to the checkout counter, I spotted some ice cream. Within a few minutes, I had filled the basket with every essential item for a happy and fulfilled life. I checked out and drove home. When I got home, my wife looked at the purchases and then looked at me. Can you guess her question? All together now, where's the bread? <laughs> Needless to say, he says, I was on my way back to the store. The pa you see, the pastor forgot the one thing he went to get the one essential product. He forgot the bread. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, there's a story of Peter, but Peter didn't forget the bread. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But, the God, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. See, Peter was responding that day out of the second book of Acts after the uh, event of Pentecost where it talks about suddenly a sound like, the right, like a mighty rushing wind, a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So Peter was standing in front of the people of Jerusalem in the plaza, speaking to all of them. He was responding to the question that the people had asked. They were amazed and perplexed, and they asked one another, what does this mean, this event that had happened? What does this mean? The sound of the rushing wind, the image of the fire, the sudden linguistic skills of the disciples. What could these occurrences mean? And he stood over the plaza full of people and proceeded to introduce the crowd to Jesus that day. Jerusalem had already heard of Jesus. He had been in the headline news regarding uh, the trial and his death seven weeks before. But did they know Jesus? So in a rapid succession, Peter 
fired off a trio of God-given endorsements of his son Jesus. And this is what he said. Number one, God proved that he sent Jesus to you by having him work miracles and wonders and signs. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. So Peter, the one that was rash, the Peter, the one that was uh, kind of leading the group of the apostles, he was now standing in the plaza speaking to all the Jewish people of the time all the ones that had heard the Holy Spirit experience on the day of Pentecost, and now they had heard their own languages being spoken in their own tongues. And he was explaining to them what that uh, wonder and sign that had happened was all about. But he was more concerned about giving them the bread of life. He was more concerned about telling them who Jesus was. See, Jesus' miracles were proof of his divinity. When he healed bodies, fed the hungry, when he commanded the waves to cease, when he called out Lazarus' dead body and gave sight to the blind man's eyes, these miracles were God's endorsement on Jesus. The Father in heaven gave Jesus his seal of approval. The second thing Peter did, he declared to them that then God delivered him to death. See, the Father had already planned and decided that Jesus would be handed over to you. He's now speaking to the people in the plaza. So you took him and had evil men put him to death on the cross. See, God deemed Jesus worthy of his most important mission to serve as a sacrifice for humankind. Not just anyone could do this. How could a sinner die for sinners, he went on to explain. That was impossible. The Lamb of God had to be perfect, flawless, and sinless. When the Romans nailed Jesus to the cross, God was signaling him out as the only sinless being ever to walk on the face of the earth, the only person qualified to bear our sins in his own body on the cross. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and, be, and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. <laughs> Amen. See, the cross was a place of shame, was actually a symbol and a token of honor bestowed. One time to one man, Jesus of Nazareth, but God did not lead, leave Jesus in the tomb. Amen? Amen. Deep within the tombs of Joseph of Arimathea, behind the secured and sealed rock, God did his greatest work. He spoke to the dead body of his incarnate son with all of hell's demons and heaven's angels watching. He called to the Rose of Sharon to lift his head, to the Lion of Judah to stretch forth his hand, to the bright morning star to shine forth his light, to the Alpha and the Omega to be... to be the beginning of life and the end of the grave. Acts chapter 24 says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So can you imagine Peter pausing at this point when he's speaking to his sermon, hearing the words echo off the walls of Jerusalem, the stone walls. Death was too much for him, for him, for him, for him, for him. Then a few seconds later, Peter stops and searches the crowd in their faces, defying someone to challenge his claim, perhaps a priest, a soldier, a cynic, someone, anyone to question his words that he was saying that day. What an opportunity it was for someone to destroy Christianity in its infancy. But but no one defied Peter. No Pharisee objected. No soldier protested. No one spoke because no one had the body as proof. The word was out that he's alive. At this moment, the people began to realize their mistake. The gravity of their crime settled over them 
like a silent hush. God came into your world, but you killed him was the thrust of Peter's message. You killed Jesus. God proved to you. All, you, all of you know this. Yet you took him and had evil men put him to death. You, you, and you. On three occasions, Peter pointed a verbal finger, but maybe even a physical one at the crowd. Suddenly, the question of the hour changed from what could this mean to what shall we do? You can read it in Acts chapter 2 verses and chapter 3 and 4. It became a question of the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Like it says in verse 37. They leaned intently into Peter's reply. See, everything was at stake at that moment. What if he says it's too late or you had your chance or you should have listened to me the first time, you should have listened to us the first time. Yet Peter, with his arms stretched out and with tears in his eyes, he gave this invitation. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Amen. See, Peter would eventually go on to speak about poverty. The church would soon address the issues of taking care of the widows and orphans, and many other matters, but not yet. The first order of the church's first sermon was this, pardon for all of our sins. That day, Peter delivered the bread, the forgiveness of sins. So would you allow me to do the same this morning? Would you consider the offer of Jesus? See, the grain to bread process is a demanding one. The seed must be planted before it can grow. The grain, when the grain is ripe, it must be cut down and ground into flour. Before it can become bread, it must pass through the oven. Bread is the end result of planting, harvesting, and heating. Jesus endured a similar process. He was born into this world. He was cut down, bruised and beaten on the threshing floor of Calvary, he passed through the fire of God's wrath for our sake. He suffered because of other sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all and was put to death and made alive to bring us to God. Amen. Amen. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. See, this morning is Communion Sunday, and we're all invited to partake. The elements are symbolisms of the broken body of Jesus on our behalf, which is represented by the wafer or bread, and the cup of juice representing the shed blood of Jesus for the remission of our sins. But before we partake, I want to read to you what John chapter 6 uh, says. It starts in verse 6, about Jesus feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. See, it was the Jewish Passover feast festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. See, Jesus was the third person of the Trinity sent to earth to die for our sins. He was already walking in revelation knowledge and wisdom. He knew the miracle that was going to take place. He just was testing to see what they would say. So Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wage to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. 
But how far will they go for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. So imagine how many people were there if there was 5,000 men. There was also women and children present. So there was a multitude of people on that day. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. Jesus then, then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted, as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. You see, anytime Jesus does something substantial in your life or in my life or the life of the church or amongst his people, he makes sure we all get fed, we all have enough, and then there's plenty left over for those that aren't able to partake. Amen? After the people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And then the story goes on to talk about Jesus walks on the water with the disciples, and then it talks about Jesus, the bread of life. In verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, was Jesus' answer to them, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what, what, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Do you believe in the one that God has sent this morning? Do you believe in the resurrection power of Jesus? Do you believe that he can meet your need this morning as we partake in communion? My question to you this morning is, do you believe? So they asked him, what sign then will he give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Verily, truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to this, well, gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Can you say amen to that? See, as we partake of communion this morning as a body of believers, his body that was beaten is a reminder to us of the bread of life. His shed blood that was flowed to the ground is a reminder of the bread of life given to us. God has, you see, God has posted his signs everywhere we look, in the universe, in scripture, even within our hearts, yet we persist in disregarding his directions. But God does not give us what we deserve. How many know that we deserve much worse than what we get from him? Amen? Amen. He has drenched this world in grace. It has no end. It has no limits. It empowers this life and enables us to live the next one. God offers second chances. Soup kitchens, off, just like soup kitchens, offer meals to everyone who asks. That includes you. So make sure you receive the bread, and once you do, 
pass it on. After all, if we don't, who will? See, governments don't feed the soul. The secular shelters can give a bed, a meal, and valuable counsel, but we can give much more. Not just help for this life, but hope for the next. Amen? You are a carrier of his anointing. You are a carrier of his presence. You are a carrier of the bread of life. If you've come into a relationship with Jesus, the bread of life that he offered is now part of you. I said it on a Thursday night. I said, of our five senses, we have sight, hearing, uh, taste, feel, and the other. Sorry? Smell. Smell. That's right. Of those senses, the one that is the most unique is taste. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can look at a gingerbread house and say, man, that looks good. Mm, That smells nice. But you'll never know how good it is until you take that piece and you taste it. What God wants you to do this morning is taste and see how the Lord is good. Let him become part of you. Let him get down down deep inside of you by accepting his work of the cross as we do in remembrance in communion. Amen? Amen. Acts 2, 38 through 39. Peter said to them, Turn to God and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children. It is for everyone our Lord God will choose, no matter where they live. Amen. Amen. Amen.